Hey guys, it's Miss Tesler. Um, so at this point, I'm probably on my maternity leave. Uh, and so uh, we are going to try this. I am going to record uh, throwing it back to PowerPoint. Um, I don't like using PowerPoints, but uh, this makes it easy for um, you guys to kind of take notes or get the information about the chapter. Um, and I get a chance to kind of teach you while I'm not there. So um, we're going to be starting chapter six, section one. Um, I'll just do a video per section so that these videos aren't uh, long and lengthy. Um, and hopefully if it's shorter, you'll be more willing to watch it. So um, chapter six is chemistry and biology. Um, and section one, we're going to be talking about atoms, elements, and compounds. And so um, when we are, you know, doing notes and all that kind of stuff, I like you to have your book open and your, and your notebook ready and, and all that kind of stuff. So chapter six starts on page 148. Um, and so hopefully you are there and we will get started. Um, the beautiful thing about this being a YouTube video um, is that if I go too fast, uh, you can always pause um, and get the information on the slide and then continue forward. Um, or put it in reverse and and re-listen to what I've said if you didn't get it or, or whatnot. So here we go. Um, again, we're going to be talking about section one, um, just the atoms, elements, and compounds today. Um, so atoms, uh, you know, years and years and years ago in you know, the history of science, um, things weren't thought of as being indivisible or divisible. Um, and then it was, you know, early BCs, um, upwards to 500 BC, where um, scientists, quote unquote, um, started, you know, hey, we can chop uh, matter down, we can chop life down, we can break it down into into different parts. And so, um, in about 500 BC, they started thinking that way, um, that we can actually break us down to an indivisible part, so that we can get down to the very source of what we're made of. Um, and then in the 1800s, we started actually having the technology to um, scientifically prove that um, and provide evidence that atoms exist. And um, quite literally, that word atom, tome means to cut, T-O-M means to cut. And then any anytime you see an A um, before a root, like I know that tome is a root, it means something, uh, uh, it means it has a Latin origin. Um, and I, so then if I have an A in front of that, it means without. A is without. So without cut is literally what an atom means. Um, and so that began kind of this science of chemistry, this branch of science called chemistry. And it's just the study of matter. And really when we get down to it, elements and compounds and atoms and all that kind of stuff. So atoms, again, meaning without cut, are the building blocks of matter. Um, they are made out of... Uh, neutrons, protons, and electrons. Um, we'll see electrons on the next slide, but neutrons are neutral in charge. So neutron, think neutral. There's no charge there. And then protons, think pro, think positive. Protons have a positive charge. And these two items, the neutrons and the protons, are located in the nucleus of an atom. Okay, so they're located in the nucleus of an atom, and they hang out together. And um, what do we know about magnets is if I take a positive side of a magnet and, a po and another magnet is positive side, and if I try to bring them together, I can't. They want to repel one another. And so if I have all of these positive uh, units, these protons in a nucleus, um, they're going to want to repel each other. So the reason a neutron, the reason we find neutrons and protons in the nucleus is the neutrons um, kind of create a buffer and they help to hold the protons together. And so um, that's why we see the neutrons and protons together there in the nucleus. The third part of an atom, um, well, of course, uh, you know, we start thinking atoms can't be divided anymore, but of course we're talking about three parts. Science is ever changing. Um, so the third part of an atom are the electrons. And there are these little red balls that you see um, in the clouds there, the kind of darker blue lines represent an electron cloud or an electron shell. Um, and uh, these guys are negatively charged particles. Um, and they are what give 
these different elements uh, their charges. Um, so electrons are negatively, negatively charged particles that are located outside the nucleus. So again, we see in the picture what we find inside the nucleus is going to be protons and neutrons. Um, on the outside, we're going to find uh, our electrons. So then we get into elements, and looking on page 149, you see a familiar image, the periodic table of elements. And these are just all pure substances that can't be broken down into any other substance by physical and or chemical means. So physically, I can't sit there with my hands and break it down anymore um, past that atom level uh, or chemically. Uh, so I can't add, you know, hydrogen peroxide or some sort of gas and I can't break it down using something. Um, so these are all pure substances. Carbon is carbon. We can't break it down anymore. Same with nitrogen. Uh, beryllium and all that kind of stuff. Um, this PowerPoint is older, so I think there's like, what, a hundred, there's way over a hundred known elements now. We're, I think we're getting up into like the 120s or something like that. Um, and each element, of course, has a unique name and symbol. And I believe last year with Mr. Peterson, you guys got to know the periodic table really well. And there it should be. So the horizontal rows. Um, are called the periods, and the vertical columns are called the groups. Um, and take note of the colors. Um, all the blue guys are identified as metals, um, yellow are non-metals, um, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so then getting into isotopes. Um, isotopes are just atoms of the same element that have the same number of protons and electrons so they still have a neutral overall charge because if I have five protons, five positive, plus five electrons, five negative, five positive and five negative is always going to be zero. Um, but what makes each of them different is they have a different number of neutrons. Okay, And um, so atoms of the same element that have the same number of protons and electrons but have a different number of neutrons. So an example that we see here on the slide is carbon-12. That's the one that's kind of naturally occurring. This is the one that we find most abundant in all living organisms. And then we've got carbon-13 and carbon-14. And carbon-14 is really popular for like half-life uh, radioactive dating. And I think you all have maybe heard of that, you know, or asked the question, you know, you've seen the articles about like um, they've exhumed a mammoth fossil or this dinosaur or these huge plants and um, like Devil's Tower and all that kind of stuff is actually this big huge tree. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, it's like a million years old and you're probably scratching your head. How did they know it was a million years old? And so carbon-14 is what actually they're using to measure the age of a fossil or a deceased organism. It can even be within the last, you know, hundred years or decades. So carbon-14, um, like what you see in the image here, if we look at the top, um, it says that it has six protons and then it has eight neutrons. And so one another element that we have in our body, we are made of a whole bunch of different elements, is nitrogen. And as nitrogen breaks down, it kind of loses its neutrons, and carbon-12 kind of picks it up. And that's how, like, kind of carbon-14 is created. Um, and then uh, it, over the years, it breaks down. And for a lot of these different elements, these isotopes, sorry, um, we have figured out its half-life, and so a half-life is the time it takes a substance to lose half of its radiological activity. So for carbon-14, it takes about little over a five, little over 5,000 years to actually lose half of its radioactive um, activity. And so if I were to exhume a mammoth fossil, mammoth remains, and I'm a scientist working out in the field and I'm bringing remains back to the lab. I run it through a spectrometer and I'm getting a calculation. The spectrometer is this fancy machine that basically tells me what this tissue is made out of. It's made out of nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, um, and the amounts, how much of all of those are left. So it'll tell me, hey, carbon-14, there's about 25% carbon-14 left in this tissue that, that comprises this tissue. And so half-life, if we originally start with 100% for everything, 
um, half of 100% is 50. And so um, we're at 50%. And so 5,000 years have passed. But I had said that it had, it had, the machine had told us that there was 25%. So half of 50 is what? 25. So from 100 to 50 was one half life. And then from 50 to 25, half of 50 is our second half life. And so I know by looking at this number that the spectrometer popped out at me um, was 25%. I know that two half lives have passed. And the half life for carbon 14 is a little over 5,000 years. So I go 2 times 5,000 equals 10,000, a little over 10,000 years. And that's how old the mammoth fossils are. So it's a really accurate um, kind of depiction of how old an organism is um, and all that kind of stuff. So radioactive isotopes, again, you know, this is talking about carbon-14, uranium, plutonium. Um, you guys have all seen like Marvel comic and DC comics and all that kind of stuff. There's always radioactive stuff that gives people superpowers or Chernobyl um, in history. Um, that tsunami in Japan or whatever. Um, it's so radioactive isotopes, all of these, they're talking about radioactive isotopes and radiation that they give off. Um, and how that radiation is given off is when that nucleus starts to break apart. Um, so the neutrons and the protons, basically the protons are leaving. Um, and it can be detected and used for many applications. We can use the stuff for cancer, for powering, for energy, um, aging, fossils, etc. So compounds, then, are when we combine two or more different elements. Um, and so, like, uh, sodium and chloride. Sodium and chloride um, are two different elements. We combine them. That's considered a compound. Uh, I've added into this slide kind of the four unique characteristics of compounds. They're always formed in a specific combination of elements in a fixed ratio. So sodium chloride always will be one sodium to one chloride. Um, when we look at um, when we look at uh, other different compounds like water, we have H2O. It's always two hydrogens to one oxygen. Um, so we always see this fixed ratio. Um, whenever I have two hydrogens with one oxygen, I always know that that is water. Compounds are chemically and physically different than the elements that make them. Uh, sodium um, is very explosive, so it, and hydrogen is very flammable. But when we put these two highly dangerous elements together, salt and ACL, um, and we have salt in every probably bit of food that we eat, um, are we starting on fire or exploding? We are not. So compounds are chemically and physically different than the elements that make them. And when these two came together, sodium and chloride, um, they created something that we love to flavor our foods with and gives, we put in baking with chocolate and it really brings out the flavor of chocolate. Compounds cannot be broken down into simpler compounds or elements by physical means. So um, I, you know, can sit there and, yeah. You know, uh, kind of using a mortar and pestle with the salts and I can try to break it down. I can break it down into smaller pieces, but I'm never, by physical means, you know, using my hands or my teeth, I'm never going to be able to break it down um, to separate that sodium and the chloride from each other. And compounds can be broken down by chemical means. So I can add a chemical. I can add something to, like, um, I've got enzymes in my saliva that helps to break down the sodium and the chloride. So that's one of the major things that your digestive system is all about, is providing enzymes, chemicals that allow for the breakdown of compounds. So there are different types of chemical bonds, and we're going to talk about two of them. Uh, the covalent bonds, uh, again, I love root words. And so covalent, co, meaning to share or together, to work together. Um, and so when I think of co, I think of sharing. And so a covalent bond is a chemical bond that forms when electrons are shared. Um, and so there's a lot, and there's some elements where they don't want to give up and they don't necessarily want to take electrons, but they're like, hey, let's be friends, let's share. And so you can see a really good example of that. Um, a good example of a uh, compound, a chemical bond is your water molecule. And so we've got, you can see, I just used a new word, molecule. 
And so a molecule is a compound in which atoms are held together by covalent bonds. Okay, so um, a molecule is just a type of compound. Okay, so we had just learned about the word compound, and a molecule is a special compound held together by covalent bonds. An example of that is water. Ionic bonds, then, um, is an electrical attraction between two oppositely charged atoms or groups of atoms. Um, and so you can see here the chlorine atom and the sodium atom. Um, if we remember that in the outer, once we get past, so that first um, electron shell you see both around sodium and chlorine, chlorine um, it holds two electrons. But then as we move further out, as we move out towards those shells, um, it likes to have eight. So in that very outer shell of the sodium ion, or these are called ions now because it's ionic bonds, but um, the sodium there, it's got one electron. And if we look at the chlorine, it's got seven electrons in that electron cloud. And sodium, it wants to keep an electron cloud it's out most, outermost electron cloud happy. And so it's a lot easier for sodium to remove that one electron to kind of give it away, to just repel it, get it, take it away. I don't want this electron. And get back to that second shell with eight, and it, it feels happy. And so it'll donate. It'll give away that electron, and chlorine will slurp it up and take it. Um, and so what ends up happening is we create ions, we create on um, what we see on the right side of this image here, we create a sodium that now has, it has a positive charge because it's lost an electron, and then the, chlor the chloride has a negative charge because it gained an electron. So when I have a positive and a negative, they wanna, they wanna stick together like a magnet. And so that's an ionic bond when um, these atoms have lost um, and gained electrons in order to change their charge and so now instead of being neutral we have a negative and a positive and they um, come together. Let me skip through that. Okay so <coughs> you'll notice if you're still looking on page 149 or skip back to it um, you know just a, uh, a statement here some atoms tend to donate or accept electrons more easily than other atoms um, if we look at the blue color there on your periodic table, um, those are your metals. They tend to donate electrons, you know, and if we think about their, um, you know, we think about uh, how they set up their electron clouds. They've usually got one or two electrons on the outside, and it's a lot easier for them to ditch those one or two than to, like, pull seven or six in. Um, and the elephant... Elephants. <laughs> the elements identified as nonmetals tend to accept those electrons, so those are your yellow guys there. Um, most ionic compounds are crystalline at room temperature and have a higher melting point. Um, so again, crystalline, um, we think of like salt crystals or sugar crystals and stuff like that, so those are ionic compounds. Alright, so that's the end.